Welcome to the Answers Yes podcast, where we interview some of the most interesting people that have said yes to opportunities in their life. We hope that through these stories, you can learn to create your own destiny by saying yes along the way. Join us as we explore the new series covering topics such as passion, integrity, and hard work. I'm your host, Jim Riley, and I hope you enjoy these interviews as much as I do. I believe that everyone has an important message worth hearing. Hello, welcome to Live Life Driven. This is the Answer is Yes podcast show. Thank you for listening. I got a question for you. We've been talking a lot about it the last couple of weeks is, are you writing down your goals? This is a great opportunity with everything that's going on in our country, COVID, pandemic, people shutting down, maybe you're shutting down, uh, maybe you're spending a lot of time at home. It's time to consider what your own values are and integrate those values into your goals and come out of this thing ahead. I know I've leveraged the last two and a half years. Uh, People are sitting on the couch and I'm here grinding away at business. So I want to encourage you to do the same thing. Within all that, I've realized how much time I've spent on my computer all the new technology that I've gotten used to, uh, including Zoom, uh, TikTok. We had a TikTok expert on the show recently. Um, and all these new challenges uh, in the era that we live in. And I got to say, I love the fact that we don't have to show up at so many office buildings and work in our desk in our little cubicles. We get to work from home in all these great places. But I've got uh, John on the line. He's from the Purple Guys, stress-free IT support. John, how's it going? Going very well. Appreciate being on. Yeah, um, I'm sorry I did not pronounce your last name, and I forgot to ask you how to pronounce it. Can you for me? <laughs> it, it is sh- Shram like ham. Shram like ham. I love it. That's the easy way to remember <laughs> that. So, uh, John Shram, you've got a story to tell. You're with the Purple Guys, and uh, what I always require my guests to do is talk about uh, kind of your past life, maybe some things that you said yes to, and what got you to where you're at today in your current career. And then I want to save some time to talk about what you guys do because I think that's where the real resource is. So how, how far back do you want me to go? Because I've, I've got kind of a an unintentional serial entrepreneur story. So. I, I would love to hear that. We've gone back as far as selling gum on the playground. So you, you could take it from there. <laughs> all right. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of brief history and try not to take up all the time with that. But uh, sort of the first thing I said yes to was uh, launching into the consulting world when I graduated from the University of Michigan. Uh, And in order to say yes to that, I had to write my name in on the interview form for Price Waterhouse. Mm. So this was back when they actually scheduled things and they used paper for scheduling things. That was a long time ago when I graduated. Imagine that. Uh, My my grade point average did not qualify me for for the interview, but I did not let that stop me. I wrote my name in and uh, they liked me enough in the interview. They brought me in and uh, I wound up with a job with Price Waterhouse. Uh, it was based out of Chicago. Um, loved it. Traveled all over the place in the U.S. Uh, did that for four years. Actually met my wife on one of the consulting engagements. Another fun thing that I said yes to. Actually, she said yes to me. Uh, <laughs> cool. uh, but then that turned into, hey, I want to start my own thing. I'm going to do my. I always had the entrepreneurial itch. Uh, and my wife and I decided, all right, let's uh, let's launch something. So we launched a branch office of the firm that she worked for. Uh, we were living in Chicago at the time, but decided to come to Kansas City. So wrote a business plan, had a 38-page operating agreement about how the profits would be split from the branch office, uh, and launched that business. Uh, it was wildly successful, uh, and it was the, the partnership was wildly unsuccessful. Ah. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> In a five-month period, we were on a million-dollar run rate uh, annualized, which was phenomenal from a a business acceleration. Uh, And the the owner of that business at that point in time chose to do the math on how the profits were going to get split, decided that's way too much money to split with anybody. And so we did part ways um, because he decided he was not going to pay us. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then we got into business uh, with, and this that was an IT staffing firm. And then the second uh, launch kind of that we said yes to because still had the entrepreneurial itch. I uh, launched a, a brand new startup from scratch. Uh, I got into business with my wife's uncle as the uh, seed capital. And in hindsight, uh, didn't need the seed capital, should have realized that then, but you know, it was okay. Uh, we had that business from uh, 1997 to 2001. So in a four-year period, we went from my wife and I as the first two employees 
to 85 employees and a $10 million run rate. John, can I stop you there real quick? Because I think sure. you brought up a very valid point that we talk to entrepreneurs a lot about, especially in my consulting business, the seed capital. You yeah. mentioned that in hindsight, you probably didn't need that. Yeah. You, you know, I a lot of entrepreneurs, they're like, oh, I want to raise money. I said, well, can you bootstrap it? Can you do it mm -hmm. without that capital? Because the second you do, you're giving something up. Uh, oh, yeah. Without creating any undue friction for family members, can you tell us a little bit about, <laughs> you know, why you decided to choose seed capital? And at what point did you realize, hey, maybe we didn't need that and we gave something up for it? Uh, it was, we didn't know what we didn't know mm -hmm. uh, at the time. That's why we felt like we needed that safety net. But yeah. in hindsight, we'd just done a <laughs> zero to a million dollar run rate in five months. Like, duh, it should have been literally a no brainer to realize, oh, we don't need somebody else's money to help get this thing going. And yeah. In the grand scheme of things, we didn't need mm -hmm. somebody else's money. So we had another partner this time. This partner was family. And instead of a 38 page operating agreement, uh, we had a one page operating agreement because it's family. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, turns out that we should have had more details on paper. Uh, and again, the business side of it was phenomenal. In a four year period, we went from zero to 85 employees and zero to $10 million in revenue. Mm. Um, but as we got more and more successful, uh, the original agreement, it was actually spelled out on that one page was, hey, you know, the whole point of this is we need some money to get started. Once we get on our feet, we want to pay you back as a, a healthy return and buy the whole thing. Yeah. Anytime we brought up that conversation, uh, it was it got worse and worse. The family dynamic was untenable. Yeah. Uh, to make matters even more complicated, my wife's dad was the brother of my wife's uncle It actually his older brother and he worked and ran one of one of the other companies underneath her uncle's portfolio so it got completely sideways really messy wow and we decided that uh this is just not worth it so we chose to exit that business we made an all-cash offer to buy it uh scraped every penny we had leveraged ourselves to our eyeballs to pull an all-cash offer together uh, and then we made the decision to uh, leave. So we resigned our positions, made the offer to buy. That was September 10th, 2001. Mm. Next day was 9-11. Yeah. So uh, wow. there was a lot of anxiety about the money and stuff, but it really truly became all about money and stuff on the next day because you know we weren't on a plane, we were in New York. Uh, yeah. It was a lot of money and stuff, but we, we basically walked away from a $10 million business. Yeah. You, you know, hard lesson learned. And, yeah. and we say as consultants, we paid the dummy tax so you don't have to. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's two big lessons in what you just said. Um, you know, cover yourself uh, mm -hmm. th with the proper documentation, obviously. Yeah. And uh, if you can bootstrap it and not bring out outside capital in, because nobody has the passion that you do when yeah. you start a business. Um, actually, there's a third lesson in there, too, is you just created a business. What do you need a safety net for? And, the, and that's about having confidence in what you can do. So I, I really appreciate you sharing that story because mm -hmm. so many people fall into that, that pitfall once oh, over and over and over again, because we lack the confidence and we want something to assure us that we're going to be okay. Oh, I, I totally agree. And you, you take other people's money and it changes the d dynamic and you know, I, I like the way Dave Ramsey put puts it that the only ship that doesn't sail is a partnership. <laughs> uh, it's uh, and, and and I've been there, done that. Now with Purple Guys, and again, we launched Purple Guys on the heels of that. Uh, and launching a business in October of 2001 was not the it was not the greatest economic environment. Yeah. Um, so we, but we survived. We got it off the ground. Uh, my wife and I were the only owners. Uh, now we actually have had partners come and go in this business. Uh, but we've always we always maintained that majority ownership until actually just very recently, mm. um, and it's been fabulous. Um, but uh, you know we bootstrapped it, we scraped every penny together, and we we I guess the third time's a charm. Finally did it right, uh, and it's been fantastic. I, I'm kind of relieved listening to your story. I thought the first story was going to end with a separation with your wife, which would have been terrible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm relieved that that's not the case and that you are successfully working together. So oh, kudos, yeah. kudos to you for sticking through three tough businesses with your spouse. It can be done. Uh, I'm in one, I'm in one business with my wife. I let her run it though. I just add support. I know better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My, my wife and I are very much a case of opposites attract. I'm an engineer. She's an evangelist. Yeah. So 
when we get going in the same direction, I can make sure the wheels don't come off and she can make sure something grows. You know, looking back at, you know, you said you scraped all your pennies together to start purple guys and at a very tough time. Oh yeah. Obviously for most of us. Um, when you look back, how do you feel about that? You know, I'm sure you, you sacrificed a lot to do that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and at the time we had, um, two children. We've since had a third along the way because, you know, Purple Guys got started in 2001. Uh, but it's it's so rewarding to know that nothing existed and now something exists because of that hard work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my entire team will tell you I can't do any of the work. So it's not like I'm doing all the work that supports our customers, but we, we built that original platform and the engine that's employed literally hundreds and hundreds of people over the years uh, and had a huge impact. So kind of looking back on, you know, if I had it to do all over again, what would I do differently? Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't take the money. I basically would, would try to do it on my own and bootstrap it from day one um, with any of the businesses I started. Um, that, that's a huge lesson learned. And then if you are going to have partners and you already touched on it, you know, you got to make sure how you're going to get divorced before you get married, which yeah. is unfortunate, but that really is how you have to look at that partnership agreement. Um, and once we had controlling interest, again, we've had very much successfully had people come and go out of the purple guys. Uh, and you can do that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm on speaking terms with everybody that uh, has been in and out of the company. Uh, they've very successfully come and gone. Um, and then just most recently after actually in February of this year, we did a transaction that, that took the brand national. So we're now part of a larger organization. I'm still a, an equity player in the company, but I am now back to, I'm a minority player, Yeah. Uh, but the, but the brand has grown. And so it, it's been a, you know, in hindsight, a great journey up to this point and still very excited about what the future holds. Well, and, and I think it's perfectly acceptable after a period of time, taking your hits and bruises, building a company up and knowing when you're willing to have less interest in that company for all yeah. the right reasons, right? Whereas yeah. in the past, your past two stories, it wasn't it wasn't on you, yeah. it was on somebody else. You know, this is this this interview is about you, but I'll t- I'm going to touch on two quick things because they're learning lessons. I raised capital for a tequila company back in 2007, eight when the market crashed. I raised 12 million dollars in the long scheme, and um, you know our investors had really zero interest in that industry but knew that it was sexy and something fun to be involved. Things change, you know, things yeah. change. And that's what you have to anticipate when you take on investors, you don't know yeah. what's going to change. And what changed for these guys is they are all in the medical field. They had zero interest in alcohol, but one of the wives of our primary investor didn't have anything to do at home. She decided, Hey, I'm going to be in the tequila business. So when you've got majority shareholders because of the money that they've put in and they say, Hey, my wife's going to come work for the company. Guess what? She's going to come work for the company, fit or no fit, yeah. right? And, and that's something that we could have never anticipated, forecasted, or even thought about. But yet the money leveraged the opportunity for this person to integrate into a company. And so we were stuck, right? I wound up leaving that company as well. It wasn't a good fit for me. And, and uh, it wasn't amicable. It wasn't good. It wasn't fun. But it was a great learning lesson. Even after that, and I've learned my lessons, uh, I started another import company. And the attorney said, look, guys, I know you're all friends here good friends, lots of history, but we're going to, you know, structure the company so that you're all protected from one another. And you know what, in hindsight, within a year, I was the only partner standing. So, um, wow. you know, we've all been through this, especially as entrepreneurs, we take our bruises. Uh, your story is unique to you guys, but it's not unique in entrepreneurship. And, mm-hmm. and I appreciate you telling those stories because um, sometimes it hurts, but people learn from that, you know? So, oh, um, yeah. Tell us about the purple guys, because that's what I'm excited about. Uh, I, I just feel like, you know, the, the world, half of us are at a loss. And have, you know, I came from a big corporate corporation. We had IT guys galore. Like if I needed one little, hey, my email didn't go through. They're there to help me. Um, yes. you, you know, tell us about the purple guys and, and what you do. Well, well, we are that. We are the IT department, but our, our niche is the company that has between 20 on the small end and 300 or so on the high end of employees. So 20 to 300 employees. 